Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of uh, Daily December 2017, uh, Day 11. Uh, I'm almost caught up to Daily December. It is only taking me like three days to do it, so congrats to me. Um, today, I want to talk about something that, to be 100% blunt, um, has removed my faith in humanity because of how quickly it has turned into politics instead of uh, talking about real serious societal issues and just throwing people under the bus and lies and mis misinformation and, and everything under the, under the sky. It's just stupid. Um, so I'm going to try and revert this back to a subject that does need to be discussed, and that is bullying and abusive behavior in general. Um, if you're not familiar uh, with the name Keaton Jones, um, he uh, is this kid whose mom uh, made, I think it was like a Facebook video is what it started out as, um, or it might have been a tweet. I don't know. Uh, but she filmed him uh, basically asking the question, why do... Uh, these bullies take joy out of bullying people. Uh, and he goes on, he, he, um, uh, it's, it's actually a, a, a remarkably uplifting uh, little video because you have this young kid who's just been bullied, apparently. Um, and uh, he starts off with a very profound question, why do people do these horrible things? How can they take joy in hurting someone else? And then by the end of it, he says, you know, hey, if this is something that you're dealing with, you know, it, it will eventually end, you know, they'll, you just, you just got to get through it. And it was this really cool thing. And then it turned political with everyone doing everything from looking up uh, and finding dirt on his mother uh, and ma uh, blatantly making up things uh, and lying about it. And it's just turned into this nightmare, but he does bring up a really good point. Uh, and it's a point that I, I think I've talked about on this channel before, but I want to talk about it uh, today specifically because, um, of how far away from the point this has become. It has now become this massive scandal where we're talking about racism and we're, we're talking about, well, why does he, you know, why does he get cool stuff when this person's been bullied or this and and they're, they're trying to measure who's been bullied more and, and they're trying to claim that they, I mean, it's just nonsense and none of it needs to be happening. This is a kid that got bullied and is now being bullied by the internet um, for speaking out about it. And uh, it really goes to show you why uh, people don't speak out about it more because this is what happens is it'll start off with, hey, you were very brave, and then it'll turn into this wave of, well, you have no right to feel the way that you feel because of insert political reason here. Um, and then you'll have people that try and take advantage of the situation monetarily, um, of which none of that has been done by the family, which claims keep coming in that the mother is trying to monetize. She hasn't earned a dime from any of this stuff. It's all lies. Um, but... Yeah, no, the, the, the real point of the entire thing uh, was that first question, how, why, why do people bully? Why, how can someone take joy in hurting another human being? Um, and um, I want to talk about that because I myself have been a victim of bullying and abuse uh, my entire life. Um, I'm very, very familiar with the subject, and I also... Um, have studied the psychological aspects of bullying. My mother, uh, for her master's thesis, actually, uh, it was entirely about um, uh, domestic violence um, and uh, the uh, idea uh, she was able to show a direct correlation between children witnessing uh, domestic violence and abuse when they are children and then being in abusive relationships when they were adults, there was a direct correlation, not causation, correlation. It's very different. Um, but that was her master's thesis. And um, again, this is a subject that I've done a lot of study into. Um, and so I just, I want to talk about, um, first of all, why it is that people bully. 
And second of all, why the uh, current attempts that I'm seeing people do, um, very good natured, like the, the intent behind it is not wrong, um, but the actions that they're taking are the exact wrong actions and are, are simply going to cause more bullying to happen, which is exactly what's happened in this situation where, you know, this kid uh, at first was lauded and got all this support and is now receiving all of this hate and stuff directed at him for something he didn't even do. Like, he is being attacked because of his mother. Um, and that's what's so wrong about this. Um, is what started out as this really amazing kind of look into, you know, the mind of a kid that's been bullying has has turned into, hey, let's see how badly we can make this kid feel about uh, himself for daring to speak up about a very serious issue. So um, what I would like uh, to start off with is um, Keaton, uh, if you are watching this, um, I have no idea why, because you have so many... Uh, so many better things you can do with your time. Uh, but I appreciate uh, that you're watching this. Um, so I'm going to try and keep this part very, very simple uh, so that you don't have to watch and listen to me ramble on and on about psychological terms and all that stuff because that is boring to most people, uh, much less you know a kid who could be going out and playing with his friends or something like that. So the very basics and simple fact of the matter is... Um, most bullies do not actually take joy from bullying other people. They don't. Um, hurting another person and taking joy out of that uh, is something that only a, a very, very, very small percentage of the population are, are even capable of doing. Um, they're all are called sociopaths, um, and uh, they lack what is called empathy. They lack the ability to... Uh, consider the feelings of other people. Um, those are really the uh, uh, the only people that could take joy in hurting another person. Um, what these bullies are doing is is not so much that they're getting joy from from bullying you or or bullying other kids. They're getting relief because and this is this is my own personal theory based on the research I've done so this is is my thoughts this is not you know I've never published an article had it peer reviewed or anything I've simply I've discussed this with my therapist and she goes yeah that makes sense um so take this with a grain of salt which means uh you can choose to believe this or you can choose to not believe this if you're not familiar with the phrase um Bullying and abuse in general is about control. These bullies, somewhere in their life, it may be at home, it may be at school itself, uh, it may be that they have parents that are bullying them, it may be that there are bad things happening in their life, like maybe they uh, have a friend or a family member that has a sickness um, that is incurable, or somebody uh, has passed away, or... Um, it may be in school they, they feel that they um, don't fit in because they're not understanding uh, things as quickly as their peers or something like that. Somewhere in their life, they feel a lack of control. As humans, we like to control things. It makes us uh, feel good. And um, a lack of control can be very disconcerting. It can, it can really, really make you feel bad. So what these bullies are doing is they are trying to exert control. And since they can't control their own lives, they're trying to control other people through bullying. If they can make you feel a certain emotion by saying things to you that make you feel bad, they, they feel that they're regaining some of the control over their life that they don't have somewhere else. And it's not that... Uh, Again, it's, it's not that they're taking joy from it. It's they need this control. They really do. They have this strong desire and need for control. And by controlling someone else, they are getting relief. They're, they're, they're feeling in control again. Um, and that's, that's my personal theory as to, to why bullying's happening. And I think psychology backs this up a lot if you get into the... Uh, more common 
um, or if you, you get into the nitty gritty and, and stuff like that. So that's, that's why these guys are doing it. They're, um, a lot of times bullies are not these horrible, disgusting, you know, wastes of, of human, uh, form that they're made out to be. They're, they're real human beings with real problems that have chosen a very unhealthy way to deal with it. In psychology, uh, what they're doing is uh, what's called a maladaptive coping method. And I know that sounds really complicated, but it basically means that they're dealing with really, really hard things for them uh, in an unhealthy way because to them it's the simplest way to do it. And a lot of times the simplest way to do something is not the most healthy and it's, it's not the best way to do something. I mean, if... I'm having issues with my computer uh, turning off because a program's not working the way it's supposed to. A very simple way to make it work would just be to pull the plug, but that could completely destroy my computer. Um, and the same thing is true about our brains and everything else. The simple way is very, uh, very rarely the best way to go about it. So that's why these kids do what they do. Or at least that's why I think they do what they do. And I, I believe that psychology supports that. Um, now I'm going to get into a lot more psychological terms and stuff like that. So, uh, again, Keaton, if you are watching this, um, you don't have to watch anymore. Uh, this is going to get really, really technical and really, really boring really quick unless you really like psychology. And if you do, that's great. Psychology is amazing and, and awesome. But um, – Know that it's not your fault. It actually has nothing to do with you personally beyond the fact that they picked you um, based on maybe nothing more than a glance or something easy for them to identify. It's, uh, they generally are going to look for the targets with the, the least amount of resistance. Again, they're looking for simple um, so it has nothing to do with you. It's not your fault. None of this is on you. These are just people that are dealing with very difficult things in very unhealthy ways. They're not monsters. They're not horrible people that deserve to get everything that they've done to other people done to them. They simply are not, uh, they're not well and they're reacting to it very, very poorly. Now, unfortunately for you, that means they're making your life miserable as well. And it, it really isn't fun, and it's not fair. And I wish it didn't happen, but it does. Um, and like you said, it, it does eventually end. It really does. Um, like I said, I was, I was bullied most of my life. Uh, still am uh, by some people. And, and it'll happen... For the rest of your life it, the the nice thing is you will learn healthy coping mechanisms good ways to deal with the negative feelings that you're feeling and good ways to deal with with bullies and, and things like that because they are everywhere um and it won't affect you as much as you get older you'll become stronger because of what you've gone through kind of like uh, a sword being tempered you know, in order for a sword to get to the point where it can hold an edge and actually be useful in battle, it has to be heated up and then pounded into a shape over and over again. Um, and that's called tempering the sword. It strengthens the metal out of it and it, and it creates a stronger weapon, a, a weapon that can actually be used. So this is going to temper you. This is going to make you stronger, and it sucks right now. It really does. But you'll get through it, and you got a lot of people pulling for you, man. So um, psychology. Psychology is fascinating and amazing, and um, I've been studying it for years as a hobby, and um, it, uh, it applies to so many aspects of our life that we never think of. Uh, the psychology I want to talk about today is what's, um, what's called the cycle of violence, um, which is used in two different ways. Um, one way it's used to uh, describe uh, abusive relationships in general, because they will generally follow a cyclical pattern of, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the official um, 
uh, pattern that I was able to find on Wikipedia. Um, it doesn't always follow this 100% every single time, but this is a basic idea of it goes abuse, guilt, excuses, normal behavior, fantasy, and planning, and then setup. Um, it starts with, uh, and it can technically start in any one of these, these areas, but the abuser abuses someone, they feel guilt over it, they start excusing their abuse or rationalizing it away. They then go into this normal behavior period where the person that's being abused goes, see, this is what the real person, when they're abusing me, that's, that's not the real person they are. This is the real person. And then uh, they start uh, noticing things that the victim is, is doing wrong. This is the fantasy and planning stages where they start coming up with lists and things like this of all these things that they're doing wrong. And then the setup is is when they basically create a situation for them to abuse again. Um, and then it just goes in the cyclical form. Um, so that's the cycle of violence as it um, refers to uh, interrelationships. They also have intergenerational, uh, an intergenerational version of the cycle of violence, which is actually um, uh, kids seeing abuse when they're younger and then uh, either enacting that abuse when they're older or participating in, a, in relationships where abuse like that is present because they, it's a learned behavior. They see it when they're young. They get to the idea that this is how the world is supposed to work. And then when they get older, that's how they view the world and that's how they view relationships. They think that that's how relationships work. Um, and so this cycle of violence doesn't stop until somebody stops it. And again, um, all of this is based on the idea of control. Abuse in general is based on control, whether it is physical abuse, um, verbal or emotional abuse, um, which uh, can actually be more damaging than physical abuse in some instances, simply because the scars from emotional abuse um, are not physically evident uh, and can actually cause severe problems for decades uh, for the person themselves. I myself have had to deal with emotional abuse and um, I am still trying to learn healthy coping mechanisms to deal with it. So um, this cycle of violence um, doesn't stop until somebody stops it. You know, a kid watches and perceives abuse when they're young, and then they make a conscious decision to not abuse someone else or to not allow, um, get into relationships where they are abused. Or if they are in abusive relationships, they end their relationships and they look for healthier relationships to be in. Um, that's how this happens. And it, it doesn't uh, happen by villainizing the abusers because, again, according to the cycle of abuse, these people probably were abused or are currently being abused um, while they are abusing others. It is a learned behavior. When you get abused, you feel a severe lack of control over your own self because you have someone else that's controlling your emotions. They may be trying to control your environment. Um, emotional abusers uh, will sometimes go as far as to control when the person can leave their house. They will control who they're allowed to speak with. They may even uh, start controlling their friends and things like that by spreading lies and rumors and things like that to break down friendships so that the abusee, the person being abused, feels that the only person that they can actually trust is their abuser. Um, and that creates serious, serious um, problems uh, with both with getting out of the relationship and with um, their own, uh, the abusee's mental health. And again, the abuser probably had the same thing happen to them um, in all but a very, very small amount of exceptions where they have an actual mental disorder that prevents them from feeling empathy. Um, in that particular case, uh, again, they're sick, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a whole different issue and it's not something that uh, anyone aside from a trained professional can actually help with. 
um, if you actually have a sociopath um, or somebody with a, a uh, severe personality disorder um, that prevents them from feeling empathy from other people, um, like narcissistic personality disorder um, or something like that, where they, they simply do not have empathy, um, you can't do anything to help them. Um, they, uh, they need professional help. End of story. Um, but for the majority of bullies, the majority of abusers, they are themselves victims of abuse. And they have learned that this is the way that the world works. And either you are the abuser or the abusee, and they have chosen to be the abuser, which is not how the world actually works. But in their mind, it's inevitable. That's, that's how you interact with people. And they need this feeling of control. And so they control other people. And the, the easiest way to do it, they're always going to take the path of least resistance. It will generally start with verbal abuse, name calling, insulting them, you know, looking specifically for things that they can tell that you're self-conscious about just by reading body language and things like that. Um, and they will attack those things. If you start to stand up to them, if you start not giving them the control that they want, they may uh, switch targets to look for an easier target, or they may go forward to physical abuse. Um, because again, if they if they have the ability to physically control the way you look by physically hurting you and, and giving you cuts and bruises and, and things like that, or uh, physically force you to do things that you wouldn't want to do, like, you know, shoving your head into a toilet, stuff like that. Again, that is them exerting control. That is them sitting, uh, trying to get this feeling of control back in, into their lives. Um, and um, when it gets physical, it theoretically can get dangerous. Um, but you actually have a lot more... Um, tools at your disposal if you're a victim of physical abuse than you do of emotional abuse. Um, physical abuse, uh, as soon as they, they touch you in a way that you don't want them to, whether it's punching you or other things I'm not going to get into, um, it's seen as assault. Um, you have the law on your side at that point. Um, if it's done in public, um, and you have witnesses, you can go, you know, if you're a kid, you can go to the office and go, hey, this person, you know, has assaulted me. If you are an adult and this is happening, you can go to the police and um, press charges for assault. Um, it's messy. It's 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 very, very difficult. And uh, it's theoretically possible that uh, they could get off scot-free. That's that's always a possibility. Um, but if there's witnesses, uh, if there's bruises and things like that, if they physically hurt you, um, you have the law on your side. Um, so as much as physical abuse is much more scary and much more dangerous, there's also a lot more actions that you can take. And it's technically much easier to prove physical abuse than emotional or, um, verbal abuse. So yeah, it, it sucks, but that's kind of how it works. And so the way that we fix this issue we have with bullies in, um, uh, this country, a lot of people think that, uh, and I've, and I've seen this, um, think that, well, what we, we, we should do is, is, is we need to punish the bullies. We need to make them feel horrible about what they're doing. Basically, uh, make them feel just as bad as they've made everyone else feel. Uh, this idea of an eye for an eye is not a unique idea. It is not a new idea and it's never worked. Bullies have existed throughout society, um, since we started forming societies and this idea of if I make the bully feel as bad as they make me feel, they will automatically stop bullying doesn't work. Again, we've already seen that bullies are already getting bullied. They already feel what you are feeling. They are trying to regain some of their control, um, back from the person that's bullying them. And uh, the thing with bullying itself is there's what's called diminishing returns. The same amount uh, of relief you get from the control over bullying one person becomes lesser and lesser the more you do it. And so it has to escalate. You have to do more and more and more to get that same feeling of relief, that same feeling of control that you so desperately want because someone else has taken it away from you. So 
this idea of let's dehumanize them, let's call them wastes of you know human garbage or all these other things I've I've seen. Guess what? That has never worked ever in the entirety of history. It is never prevented bullying. Now, standing up to a bullying, uh, standing up to a bully can help stop bullying against a specific person. Um, and if we were to get everybody in the entire world to stand up to bullies, theoretically, um, it would make things more difficult for them to continue bullying. But that's not physically possible. Um, we would have to, I mean, we're talking about a universal stance on something that um, just simply can't happen for a number of reasons. A lot of people don't realize, uh, some people don't realize they're even being abused, being bullied. Um, and so they can't stand up to it because they're, they, they rationalize it in their selves, in themselves that this is what's going on and it's completely normal and that's why they do it to other people. So that's never going to work. Telling people to stand up to bullying is never going to stop bullying. What we need to do is we need to talk about the psychology behind bullying, this idea of abuse is generally about controlling another person. And we need to talk about the fact that bullying is a maladaptive coping method. Now, to give you an example that might make more sense to you than, well, bullying is a maladaptive coping method. No, bullying is mean. And Here's another maladaptive coping method um, that uh, most people that deal with anxiety will recognize this as a really, really bad thing to do, especially if you have had any sort of therapy or any sort of psychological support. Um, you have been taught that this is a bad thing for you to do if you have had anxiety. Um, there's a term for it. Um, I call it catastrophizing. I think there's, um, I think there's other terms, but it's basically the idea that when something bad happens, um, you instantly take it to the worst possible outcome that it could possibly mean and react to that outcome. Um, this is a maladaptive coping, coping mechanism. I'm going to try this again. This is a maladaptive coping mechanism or an anti-coping mechanism because you're not coping with your feelings of anxiety or anything. The reason people do this is, again, control. They feel something bad has happened. It's taken the control away from them. So now they're trying to regain that control. And in this particular instance, they're regaining that control by predicting the future. They know everything that's going to happen going forward. You know, they've, they've, they've come up with this plan and they know everything is going to happen and they're planning and they're reacting to what hasn't happened already. And that gives you a huge sense of control if you can predict the future. Um, however, um, from basic rules of logic, the argument that they use in order to get there is what's called a slippery slope fallacy. Um, they say, because this happened, then this will happen, then this will happen, and then this will happen. And theoretically, it's possible those things could happen, but there's no guarantee that that's the way they are going to happen. The slippery slope fallacy relies on saying, well, no, this is the natural result. This is the only path it could possibly take. When in all actuality, there are many, many different things that could happen that would completely destroy that thought process, that whole line of thinking. But it's really, really quick to come up with the absolute worst case scenario and then start, you know, uh, talking about it and, and complaining about it and trying to prepare for this worst case scenario that is bound to happen. That's really, really easy to do. And it makes you feel in control. What it actually does, though, is your brain um, is wired and the way that you think and the way that you approach problems um, is based on the wiring of your brain. You have these neural pathways in your brain. The more you use those neural pathways, the stronger they become. And the more often your brain will just divert to that pathway. So the more often you catastrophize things and you always think that the absolute worst thing is going to happen, the more your brain naturally will do that. Which again, when you think the absolute worst thing in the world is going to happen, that's going to increase your anxiety, not decrease it. Despite the fact that it feels good for a little bit, you are actually hurting your anxiety. You are making it worse by doing this. 
that is a maladaptive coping method. Um, uh, a healthy coping uh, method when given bad news or things like that is to step back when you start feeling these thoughts of, well, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and, and everything's going to be horribly wrong, is to step back, actually look at the problem from an outsider's perspective, and come up with a plan to deal with what's going on. Whether that means, okay, I've just lost my job. Um, maladaptive coping method, I've lost my job, that means I'm going to lose my house, I'm going to lose my health insurance, and then, oh God, I'm probably going to get sick, and then I'm going to have to go to the emergency room, and then I'm never going to be able to pay it, I'm going to be in debt for the rest of my life, I am going to go bankrupt, and then I'm going to die because I'm going to be homeless on the street and not be able to get to the, it doesn't help anything. However, if you sit there, I don't have a job right now, well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apply for unemployment, see if I can get that, because that'll help. And then I'm going to come up with a plan to get a new job. And if that doesn't help, then we keep going and we keep looking for solutions as opposed to creating problems that have no solution or the only solution is your inevitable death or something like that. That is a healthy coping mechanism is, is trying to sit there and go, okay, the world hasn't ended. Something bad has happened. Let's deal with this. Um, so again, I use that example to show you the difference between maladaptive coping methods and how, um, how easy it is to get into this rut of using maladaptive coping me uh, methods. Now, when you're talking about bullying, that's, that's exactly what it is. They, something bad has happened to them. They are reacting to it by making something bad happen to someone else because it makes them feel like they're in control of something because this other thing that happened has made them feel powerless, has made them feel not in control. And again, it's a simple solution, but it doesn't actually help anyone. It doesn't actually make them feel better. It gives them a false sense of control. They're not really actually controlling that person. Um, they're making them feel bad. But they're not controlling them. They're, they're, they're not actually making them do anything. They're simply affecting their emotional state for a short period of time. Um, so this feeling of control that they're, they're getting from it is not real. And then the more that they do that, again, we, we build these pathways in our brains. We, we build them, and the more you use them, the easier it is to just revert to that as a natural way to deal with your problems and the harder it is to uh, learn more healthy ways to deal with it so if we really really want to stop bullying if this is if this is what your goal is and it's not just this vendetta against bullies because you were bullied as a kid and you want to hurt them just like they hurt you by the way that's a maladaptive coping mechanism that's the exact thought process that they used to bully you so if you want to become the bully, then go ahead. Go ahead and do that. That's not going to stop bullying. What that's going to do is going to make sure that bullying continues to get worse and worse and worse and abuse continues to get worse and worse and worse. And we're going to see increases in suicides. We're going to see increases in um, homicides and things like that because as the bullying escalates, as the control um diminishing returns forces them to continue to escalate over and over and over again, they eventually are going to do something irreparable. So if that's your thought process, if that is what you want, if you just want to see bullying keep getting worse and worse and worse, then yes, let's dehumanize bullies. Let's call them horrible, disgusting wastes of human filth. However, if you want to stop bullying... The only way that is going to happen is we need to start talking about mental health. We need to start talking about it for real. Not that, oh, and sometimes there's mental health problems, but we're going to talk about this blah, 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 and then completely gloss over it. No, mental health and mental illness is a real thing. One, uh, depending on the numbers that you use, um, uh, anywhere between one in five and one in four people uh, every year have a diagnosable and treatable mental disorder. Um, that means if you know five people, you know somebody with a mental disorder. 
All right. It is normal. It is a hundred percent normal to deal with things like this. Our brains are wired that way. Mental disorders are just getting sick. It is the exact same thing as getting the flu and you would, or, um, uh, breaking your leg and you would never ever in a million years, see someone with a bone sticking out of their leg and go, really, have you tried just like walking like a normal person? Like you're making this huge deal out of this bone sticking out of your leg. But you know what? There are kids in Palestine that are dying every single day. And you are sitting there with a bone sticking out of your leg saying, oh, this is so bad. Just, you know, like everybody else, look at me. I can walk. Why don't you walk? Just like everybody else. You never do that. However, with mental health, we have this strange idea that because um, it is mental rather than physical, that somehow it's not as real. We have empirical evidence that shows the contrary. Um, I think, um, uh, not CAT scans, uh, PET scans. We have PET scans of people's brains with anxiety compared to people's, uh, compared to um, mentally healthy people's brains, and they act differently. They work differently. The same is true about depression and, and a bunch of other mental disorders. We have empirical evidence that it is a physical problem. You just can't see their brain and you can't tell how it works. So if you want to stop bullying, we need to talk about mental health and mental illness as if it's a real thing that everybody needs to deal with from a very young age. We need to talk about the difference between maladaptive coping methods and healthy coping methods. We need to talk about how do you deal with a loss of control in your life? How do you deal with negative things happening to you? What are healthy ways to deal with it? What are unhealthy ways to deal with it? We need to talk about all of this stuff and we need to talk about it with young children. We need this to be part of the curriculum because by the time you get to my age, I have... Let's see, I have major depressive disorder, sometimes called clinical depression. Um, I have generalized anxiety. Dis I have chronic generalized anxiety disorder. I have social anxiety disorder. I have panic disorder with agoraphobia. Um, I'm 29 years old, and I can't leave my room 95% of the day. I have to stay here. It doesn't matter with the fact that, like, the bathroom is outside of my room. Um, I have become incredibly good at just holding until I can convince myself to brave the 10 feet it takes for me to get from my door to my room. It doesn't matter if I'm dying of thirst and there's nothing to drink in the entirety of my room. Um, I've spent entire days without food because I couldn't leave my room. I've spent um, entire days without drinking anything because I couldn't get out of my room because I'm so terrified of the world outside and having a panic attack where I can't feel safe and I can't get back to my safe place. Um, so, yeah, this, this is what happens when you don't deal with it. And by the time you're 29 like I am, and uh, I'm, I'm, having, uh, I'm having to learn healthy coping mechanisms, uh, and I'm having to rewire my brain, which is really, really hard. And it takes an insane amount of work. Um, and I've been lucky enough to have a phenomenal, I have a phenomenal doctor, I have a phenomenal psychiatrist, and I have a phenomenal therapist that have all been helping me to work through this for years now. Um, but it's not easy. Again, I've been dealing with this for years, over a decade. And, um, and it's not easy. It's never easy. Um, but theoretically, um, it's possible to get past it. And there are, there are certain mental disorders that there are no cures for. I will have major depressive disorder for the rest of my life. I will have uh, generalized anxiety disorder for the rest of my life. I will have issues with those for the rest of my life. And it's theoretically possible that I may never be able to hold a regular job again. Um, because of these disorders, they are that debilitating to where I cannot, uh, work a, uh, any kind of job.
but it doesn't mean I'm going to give up. It doesn't mean I'm just going to simply accept that my life is over. No, I'm going to continue fighting. I'm going to continue going and I'm going to continue educating myself because education and understanding what's going on in my brain, understanding um, and recognizing the maladaptive coping uh, methods that I use on a daily basis and learning to stop those bad thought processes and, and replace them with healthy ways to deal with this. It's the only way I'm ever going to get better. It's the only way anyone is ever going to get better. Bullies have issues. They do. Bad things are happening to them, and they're reacting to them in an un unhealthy way. You want to fix bullying? You want to get rid of bullying in the world? Uh, then we need to stop treating bullies as if they are scum. We need to stop bullying the bullies, and we need to start treating everyone the same way. We are flawed human beings. Our brains... Um, work in certain ways and we generally um it's much easier to make bad decisions than it is to make good decisions the bad decision is 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 a lot of the times a lot easier but the end result of a bad decision is a bad situation the end result of a good uh, decision is a good situation so yeah it sucks that good decisions are more difficult to make and healthy coping mechanisms are significantly harder to learn than uh, unhealthy ones but we gotta we gotta talk about this. We gotta talk about this in a frank way. We've gotta stop demonizing these people. They are not inhuman scum. They're people that are probably being abused and are reacting to it in a very bad way. And they're making the problem worse. If we wanna make it better, we need to educate them, we need to educate the people that are being bullied, we need to educate everybody to understand what it is that's going on here because as as long as it remains this mystery of we don't know why people bully it's just that they're horrible people and they need to die as long as that's the prevailing thought process bullies are going to continue to exist um there's a scene in the first avengers that i love because it's amazing loki comes out and uh, after uh, blowing up a party and doing all these bad things, he comes out and he gets all these people to kneel down. And he goes, isn't this your um, natural position? Isn't this the way that you should be? And somebody stands up and he goes, I will not kneel to you. And uh, he says, there's always going to be people like you. And I'm not going to kneel to that. And it's such a powerful scene because it's so true. He was referencing uh, the fact that the last person that came around saying that you should worship me, you should kneel to me, uh, did horrendous horrible things and this is generally what happens bullies get into positions of power by bullying their way up and then they use that power uh, again things have to escalate and that's how you get uh, dictators that execute thousands of people of their own people as a way to feel that they're in control and that's how you get the extermination of an entire race of people you know that's how this stuff happens is is by sitting here and trying to attack and and um, uh, abuse the abusers into not being abusers anymore. It doesn't work that way. Anyway, I've rambled on about this long enough. Uh, this is probably an ungodly long video. So if you've kept up with this, thank you very much. Um, please, please, please look into the psychology of bullying. Look into abuse. Um, one thing... Um, I think everybody should be made aware of uh, is the term codependent. Um, it is uh, it's a psychological condition. Um, generally, people that that tend to be in abusive relationships they they have what's called codependency, um, and they can be both abusers and the victims of abuse. Um, but codependency is something that we don't talk about, and uh, it's something you should look up. And I may do uh, an episode on codependency sometime later. Um, but yeah. That's all for me.
right now. I've got one more video. I don't know if I'm going to be able to film it tonight because, again, withdrawal sucks, man. But, um, yeah, that's all for me. See you guys next time. All right? Bye.